scripture reading is found in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Father in heaven, we invite your spirit again and we pray that we may see Jesus right now. And we pray that you would open the world and touch the hearts. In Jesus' merits we pray, Lord, and thank you. Amen. We will start, we'll a, new start a new series today. Series. And we will dive in the most difficult, most important, vital subject of the whole Bible. If you get this subject, you get all. And if you don't get this subject, all you have values zero. And I want to start with something that is very important. And, you know, when I talk, many times, I don't know, but something happens after I eat. Is something wrong with me? Yes? No? What? Why do you smile? Come on. I'm trying to preach a sermon here. I don't know why you smile. Oh, man. Let me ask you something. If you have lettuce, is lettuce good or not? Is lettuce or spinach good or not? Yes or no? Are you sure? Is it healthy for you? Okay. I ate and forgot the lettuce on my tooth. Was it good? But, but you just said that lettuce is good. What happened? The lettuce was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you follow me? If you eat and you forget the spinach here, and you talk to people and everybody is laughing, hey, you can say, spinach is perfect. I am a vegetarian. Well, let me tell you, it's not good for you if it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. You follow me? You should have brushed your teeth after you eat. Okay? Let me ask you something. Are the doctrines good or bad? Huh? Church, I need an answer. Are the doctrines good or bad? Are you sure the doctrines are good? For instance, Sabbath, is it good or bad? No question they are good. They are in the Bible, they are inspired, they come from God. Aren't they? Could they be bad for you? Yes or no? Well, that's a tough question. Don't tell anybody that the pastor said the doctrines are bad because that's not what I am saying. I have a different point. I want to give you an example. Sabbath is extremely important. It is biblical. It is what God gave us. Okay? No question. But Pharisees kept Sabbath, didn't they? Oh, they didn't work on Sabbath. I can tell you that for sure. They were better than we are. Nevertheless, they killed Jesus. So, how did they keep Sabbath is my question. I'm going to give you an example of the fourth commandment. Should we keep the whole commandment or just part of the commandment? What do you think? The whole thing. Well, the first part says that six days you should work. Who talks about that? Doesn't it? Isn't not part of the fourth commandment? Six days you should do all your work. You know, there are a bunch of people that break the fourth commandment by not working. You follow me? In fact, they sanctify every day because they are lazy. They don't sanctify only Sabbath. If you keep Sabbath by not working, can it be that it's not that you keep Sabbath by not working, but you actually keep Sabbath by encountering God? What was the reason God gave us Sabbath? Didn't he intend that we have time with God? So if you go to church, don't work, but you never meet God and never spend time with God. In fact, you break Sabbath without knowing that you break Sabbath. Do you follow me? Let's take a different doctrine or belief. Let's talk about, uh, I don't know, state of the dead. Just because you believe that people when die, they go in the ground, is it going to save you? I really doubt. Let's talk something that is not one of the 28 beliefs. Let's talk about health. The fact that we are vegetarians, is it going to save us? Are we really keeping the health reform? It's extremely important. Health reform is extremely important. 
when do we do the exercise? You follow me? What about sleep? Don't we need sleep and clean air? Just because we don't eat this and that, it doesn't mean that we live healthy? Let me tell you, do you know how bad refined products are? How many times we eat soy ice cream, soy hamburgers, soy potatoes, soy pears, soy, you follow me what I want to say, soy this and soy that, and do you think it's healthy to eat refined soy and name it ice cream? You better go and get an ice cream. Make sure that it's chocolate ice cream, and that's really. I'm not saying that health is not important. Health is extremely important. But can it be that we think we do right and actually we do wrong? Well, let me say this. Like worship. What is worship? The fact that we come to church Saturday morning? Shouldn't worship be what it means? You come in God's presence and actually worship God? Worship is not a program. Worship should be actually worshiping God. So, let me go through this. If somebody comes to you and says, tell me in one minute, what do you believe, guys? What do you say? Well, let me tell you. 28 doctrines. The first one, take, 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 the second. after one hour, he's going to say, sorry, I have no time, next time. And I promise you there will be no next time. It's like if my wife calls me and I am driving and says, honey, can you, when you come home, stop and get and this and that and that. Hold on a second, I'm going to forget. If you would say, get some oil and some salt, or you say, get some onions and some potatoes, I could remember, but when you give me a list of 28 things to buy, I already forgot the first one before you got to the fifth one. Would you mind to send me a text message? You follow me? If my wife gave me a grocery list of 28 things, do you think I would remember the stuff? No. That's what we do with people. We just tell and tell and tell people that don't understand and don't know. What should you tell them when you meet them? I mean, yes, you can tell the seven S, the basics. You know what the seven S is? Do you know what the seven S is? Let me give you. Remember, Sabbath. State of the dead, salvation, sanctuary, second coming, spirit of prophecy, stewardship. Those are the seven basics. Seven S. Do you remember that? No. How could you remember 28 then? Okay. So, you cannot even tell the seven S, the basics. Moreover, 28. And not to mention that we have a bunch of other things above the 28 doctrines. So, what is the center. What is the truth? What is the truth? When we say we have the truth, we mean we have the 28 biblical doctrines. But can it be that we are wrong? Listen carefully. Jesus says, I am the truth. Jesus, talking to the Pharisees, said, You search the scriptures. Is it good or bad to read the Bible? Absolutely good. Hoping that when you search the scriptures, you get eternal life. You go to church, you read the Bible, you pray, you eat healthy, hoping that you do what is right to be saved. But the scriptures actually are not going to save you. The scriptures testify about me. It is me that saves you. You follow me? So folks, keep it in mind. It can happen that you have all the right doctrines. All the right understanding. Don't get me wrong. Doctrines are good. I am not talking against the doctrines. It may happen that you keep Sabbath and believe the right things and know them. And in the same time, you are stuck in forms and beliefs and you miss the point. Pharisees were God's people. They were the Seventh-day Adventists of that time. And they missed the point big time. Can it be? When Jesus talks about the ten virgins, he doesn't talk about the world. He talks about the church because virgins are pure and the church is pure. And five of them miss the point big time. When you search the scriptures, when you pray, when you go to church to worship, if you don't encounter God, you lose your time. Your prayer has no value. Your Bible reading has no value. Your church worship has no value. You better don't lose your time anymore. Do something else. 
because prayer is meant to connect you with God. And if you just say the prayer and you don't connect, you miss the point. Bible is meant to teach you about God. And if you didn't learn more about God, you miss the point. You follow me? So in all you do, in all these 28 beliefs, if you don't find God through them, you miss the point. So let's start with what is important. How do we make sure that we don't get stuck into beliefs, forms, and we miss the spirit of the forms, the reason of the forms? How can it be that many times we listen to sermons for a lifetime, we have the right beliefs, but we still are never changed. We have the same old heart, same old struggles, same doubts. Should it be church that after 20 years of being an Adventist, Adventist, we should be changed? How do you explain that very seldom people change? So, <clears throat> Peter believed in the Bible doctrines, didn't he? But Peter, when he preached and 3,000 and then 5,000 got baptized, which one of the 28 did he preach? Did he preach the Sabbath? Did he preach the state of the dead? Did he preach the second coming? Did he preach the sanctuary? You know what he preached? Jesus is God. You crucified him, you need to get him to be saved. Period. That was his sermon. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And 5,000 got baptized. Do you get the point, church? If you have the doctrines and you don't have the God of the doctrines, doctrines are not going to change, transform, save. Not because they are bad. But if you get the God of the doctrines, you will not ignore the doctrines. You will have the doctrines. But the God of the doctrines is going to change your heart. Does it make any sense? So, let me start with the beginning. Right the way the Bible starts. It says, in the beginning, God. In Hebrew, is two words. It says, Reishaif Elohim. But you know how you translate? The English translation is very poor. Reishaif doesn't translate in the beginning, but it translates first chief before anything else. First is God. He is the chief. He should be before anything else. Should be the beginning, the middle, the end, the everything. Basically, the Bible doesn't say that in the beginning God created. It says that in the beginning, before anything else, is God and should be God in your life. Not only at creation, but before anything else. God should be the first one. You follow me? And then Elohim, by the way. Elohim, there. If you go to the Hebrew grammar, you can check it. It's plural, it's not singular. It's, it doesn't say God. It says Godhead, the divine. Before anything else, should be the Trinity, should be the Godhead, should be the divine. That should be the center of your life. And even when we go there and we say, in the beginning of anything else, should be God. If you don't have this truth, all you have has zero value. If you don't have God, folks, you can believe the right beliefs. Still, you will not be saved. We need to check ourselves. Because many times we get so stuck in the forms and we feel that if we go to church and keep Sabbath and know the prophecies and eat properly, we feel that we are okay. And we can fool ourselves. Because when he comes and says, I don't know you. Lord, haven't we kept Sabbath? Haven't we prophesied, did evangelism? Yeah, 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 but you don't know me, I don't know you. So, when we say in the beginning should be God, before anything else, the first one, the chief of our life should be God. Even there, we, we get mixed up, very mixed up. For instance, uh, for instance, what is God? What, when you say God, we need to, to, to have God as the center of our life. What is God? What is God? Because you see, this is the center of the scripture. This is the main part of the scripture. Uh, we don't talk about a doctrine. All the other truths, all the other doctrines, all the other beliefs should be centered around this one. God is the beginning. God is the center of our church, of our life, of our prayer, of our worship, everything. But listen, what is God? If I say horse, what do you think? 
some of you Lexington, but you should think about a horse, not about Lexington. When I say horse, what do you think? You know what, how he looks like? You know the ears, the tail, the four legs? When I say pen, what do you think? Okay? When I say Spanish, what do you think? When I say bench, what do you see in your mind, in your imagination? Okay, now when I say God, what do you think about? Do you follow me? Where do you put God in the picture? How do you explain God? Can you explain God? Let me say, God is infinite. You agree with me? But we have a very, 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 very small mind, very finite, very little mind. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Now, how could a limited mind explain the unlimited and infinite? You follow me? It's like you would ask a mosquito to explain a Mac computer. Does it make any sense? How could we, that are very limited, explain God the infinite? Therefore, the Bible says in several places, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable, unfathomable are his ways. Can you really understand God or his ways? He possesses immortality. Basically, you say he has no beginning and no end. When you say God has no beginning and no end, try to understand that. How far do you go in the past or in the future? Can you grasp it? God is every place in the same time. How do you explain that? Can you? Unlimited wisdom. He knows everything. Can you explain that? Unlimited power. He can do absolutely anything. He, in fact, has so much energy in his words that if God says, he doesn't have to act. It happens. Let there be light. I mean, he didn't touch it. He says to the mountain, move. And the mountain moves. How do you explain that? We can hardly explain a few small things. Moreover, how could we explain God? What do you think when you say God? His greatness is unsearchable. Look what Tozer says in the book called The Knowledge of the Holy, page 13. The yearning to know what cannot be known, to comprehend the incomprehensible, to touch the untouchable, and taste the unapproachable. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than what he is. In itself, this is a monstrous sin. It substitutes the God with one that is made in our likeness. The things of God knows no man, but only the Spirit of God. Only to be an equal with God that you could communicate the mystery of the Godhead. Even God's mind is so far from us as heaven from earth. So, folks, let me say this. A finite mind cannot understand or explain God. Uh, for instance, if you put a worm that is in your apple or in your cherry here, and then you put my puppy Gucci here, and then you put a human being, let's say me or you, here, and then you put an angel. Humans are a little below angels, the Bible says. You put an angel here, an angel here, and then you put God here. The distance between the worm and my puppy is so big. The distance between my puppy and me is so big. The distance between me and angels is so big. And the distance between an angel and God is how big? Do you follow me? If you take the whole universe that has, nobody knows, billions and billions and zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of, of, of suns and planets and galaxies, God made them and he is above the universe. You follow me? And you want to understand him when we cannot even understand the universe? To try to explain God, it's a sin, because he cannot be explained. In the moment when you put the infinite in limited human words, you already made God small. You serve Satan. You know why? Satan tries to make God small. Let God be God. Therefore, let me say this. When Moses talked to God and said, 
And by the way, just because we can explain some things doesn't mean that we can explain everything. Don't even try to explain God. Moses said to God, show me your glory. I want to know you. Let me see you. I want to I know who I am talking with. God looks to him, shakes his head, and says, you don't know what you talk about, do you? And God says, probably. It's not in the Bible. God says, can you see the whole universe? No. Can you see the, at least the whole galaxy that you are in? No. Can you see the solar system that you are in? No. Okay, can you see the whole planet Earth? No. Can you see the bottom of the ocean? No. Well, I made those all, and I am above them all. You want to see me? And God said to Moses, listen, I'm going to put you in the cave. I'm going to cover the cave well, pass by, go. When I am 100 miles away, I'm going to uncover the cave and let you see only a speck of a dust of a granule of my glory. You follow me? I'm going to let you see just, just a little, little millimeter, even less, of my glory. And Moses was like blinded. And he started to shine. And that was too much. And God said, I cannot let you see me because no human can see me and live. If you see me, you will die Hiroshima, kind of. I cannot try to explain because you'll never grasp it in your brain. But I can do something for you to help you. What I'm going to do for you, I'm going to tell you a little about me. And what did God tell Moses? He didn't see much. He just heard a voice saying, God, God, he's full of mercy, full of love, full of compassion, ready to forgive. You, you follow me? So when you say, I want to know God, what actually is he willing to tell you? About his character. Do you see the point? So let's go a little deeper in it. If we talk about God, do you know why God hates idolatry? Why would God hate idolatry? Because if idols are not real, then there's no point to hate them. I tell you why. Because I, when God says, don't have other gods, don't make images, don't make icons or idols or even pictures of God, what does he mean? Listen, it is exactly what Satan would want you to do. Because when you try to picture God or to explain God, you misrepresent him. Why? Idolatry takes the God who is infinite and makes him in something that could be seen and understood, makes him small. It takes the incomparable and compares him with something. The inimaginable and makes him in imaginable. The infinite and makes him finite. The eternal and makes him limited. The one that words, human words cannot express, mind cannot grasp, pictures cannot depict. The unlimited and makes him small. The ineffable, unutterable, undescribable shrinks him to some words and some pictures. Satan wants you to do that. Basically, when you do that, you do exactly what Satan is trying to do. That's absurd. God says, hey, I want you to show a little about me, and I made you because you are in my image, and you don't know you. How can you know me? I want you to show me, you about me, so I sent Jesus. When I, want you to tell, when I want you to know who I am, I sent Jesus. By the way, we talk about idolatry. This is the craziest, funniest thing in idolatry. The Bible in Isaiah 44 talks about it. It says, you take a piece of wood, you cut the tree from behind your house in the backyard, and you take the tree and make uh, furniture, and this part of the tree, wood for fire, and this part of the tree, you make a god. Now, you got to be very careful so you don't use the part for god for the part for fire, because if you don't pay attention, you burn god. And if you have a fire in the house, you need to run and save God. If not, he's going to burn with the house. Isn't it supposed that God saves you, not you save God? That's idolatry. You make God so small that you have no respect and no fear and no faith. And because you try to explain him, you limit him and then you don't trust him. Let God be infinite. Because that's the way he is. So, let's move on. When God 
tried to show a little about himself to the limited human mind, he sent Jesus. But Jesus didn't come in godly form. Because if Jesus came in godly form, we could not understand, we could not see him, we would have died. Jesus came in human form. So how much we know about God? He gave us exactly what we could understand in our mindset. Jesus didn't come to reveal God's shape or nature or infinity or power or omnipresence. Jesus didn't come to show the essence, the nature, the body of God. Jesus came to show the character of God. Jesus came to reveal God's character, to show that God is love. Listen what he says. Jesus reveals God's character. And what God decided to reveal is extremely important. It is essential for our salvation. It's actually the central truth in the Bible. What is the most important, most essential doctrine of the Bible? Do you get the point? Am I saying that the other doctrines are not important? No. I am saying that this is it. The whole Bible gravitates the whole doctrines, the whole system of beliefs, everything, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the sanctuary, everything in the Bible talks about God and gravitates around God and this three-word sentence that God gives to describe himself when he says, he does not love, does not know God because to know God is to love because God is what? That's all we have as a description of God in the Bible. He's not saying God is loving. He says God is love. In Greek, there it's a noun. God is love. That's all we know about God. God is love. It doesn't talk about God's characteristics. It talks about God and who he is. And even when you say God is love, we are lost. Because God's love cannot be compared to what we understand humans as the word love. Because God's love is so far from our love as heaven from earth. You follow me? So even that word we cannot understand. How do you explain God's infinite love? Listen, folks. To behold his love is the most powerful force in the universe. It is the single doctrine that can change you and save you. Basically, all other beliefs that we have, they are all wonderful and good and inspired and biblical. But unless they talk about God and about his love, they have no value. I don't know if you heard what I said. When you go to church, if you don't understand that God is love, it has no value. When you pray, if you don't focus in knowing God and his love, it has no value. When you study the Bible, if you don't get God and his love, it has no value. Whatever you believe, if it's not focused on God in the center and his love, it has no value. It's like the bicycle wheel, the sp spokes, or however you call them in English, and the hub. God is love is the hub. All the others have to be connected, have to be, must be connected. Whatever you believe, if it's not connected to the hub, it's not going to save you. Doctrines are good, but they need to be connected to God's love. If you go to church and you don't know that God is love, you know what you do? Next. Love makes children feel safe. That's what psychology says. Children that don't have love don't feel safe. People that don't experience God's love and grace surround themselves with rules to feel safe. Do you follow me? Rules are not bad. But when you understand that God is love, then the doctrines flow naturally without human effort. You don't struggle to keep Sabbath. You enjoy because you experience God. Do you follow me? You don't struggle to get time to pray and to study. You love it because you experience God. All the doctrines that you have have to be connected to the hub, to the definition that we have, that only thing that God gave us about himself. God is love. That's all we have, and that's sufficient for salvation. And in fact, that's what would change you. All the human effort would never change a heart. 
And the Bible says that we are changed by beholding. We look in a mirror dimly, and by beholding his grace and his love, we are changed from glory to glory. And the spirit of prophecy says we are changed without human effort, only beholding his love. If you don't behold God is love, you will never be saved or changed. That's what the Bible says. That we need to know the love of God that actually passes any human knowledge. How can you know the unknowable? How can you know something that would pass the capacity of human knowledge? Nevertheless, the Bible says, seek my face. Search for God. To know God is life eternal, John 17, 3. To know God is life. Therefore, the Bible says, if you seek me, I will let myself be found. God doesn't talk about you'll find his nature. Oh, you'll be able to see him as he is. God talks about the more you seek him, the more he would allow you to understand his love. That's what he discovered to you and to me. And the more you understand his love, the more faith and peace and trust you have. If you doubt, it means that you don't understand his love. And the more peace and faith you have in him, the more you trust him, the more you love him when you see how he is. And the more you love him, the closer you get to him and seek him even more. We talked about that some time ago. Basically, what is God? No one knows. Not even angels. Not one in the universe. Because to know God, you need to be like God. If you are lower than God, you cannot really grasp God. That bridge will never be crossed. In eternity, we'll learn more and more and more about God, but we'll never fully understand God. It's the most profound of all mysteries of all times in the whole universe. However, this is what we know. God is love. To know this truth, that is the central truth, that all the other truths should, should gravitate and be connected to this one, that God is love is vital. It's the most important part of life. The most important truth in the whole universe. Everything else we know or do, including going to church, praying, studying the Bible, keeping Sabbath, including all the doctrines, all the teachings, has no value, no power to change or save unless it's centered in this three-word sentence. God is love. Unless it supports this truth. And to know this sentence, the love of God, to reflect it, to behold it, to spend time with it, is life eternal. And is the most powerful force in the universe that can change a heart and save the greatest sinner. To reflect this three-word sentence, God is love, is the single power that can change and save. There is nothing else all the others follow naturally after this one. It is like, I like what the pastor says. I, we are friends, we meet at care meetings and talk. And he gives this amazing example. He says, I, I tell you why. I used to do that. When they would have board meetings, when they would have board meetings, I would go in the attic and listen to the, I don't know how you call it, the, the, things that they used to heat the room. It's like some elements that have radiators, water, hot water in them. And during the summer, they are empty. And I would go in the attic, open the faucet, and make sure that the faucet is open in the boardroom, and listen to the pipe. And I knew all the secrets of the board. And I would tell my dad, I know exactly what you talked about. And my dad says, you know nothing. You just got a speck of a discussion of a paragraph. You know nothing. That's what we think we know about God. We know nothing. It's what that pastor says. If you are in a room and there is a big, big, gigantic, thick, strong wall and God is behind that wall and if in the room there is a door and there is a keyhole in the door that you put the key in to open the door and if you get down and look through that keyhole, the room inside, it's infinite. It's greater than the universe. And when you look through that keyhole, you see a pew, a bright light, and you take your eye and says, man, now I see blue stars. And you say, I know God. You have seen a speck, 
of a speck of a particle of God's light. That's all you know. And you are a speck of a particle of a dust that if you look not from God's perspective, not from the universe perspective, not from the galaxy perspective, not from the earth perspective, if you look just from a plane, you don't see you. You are so small. We are a speck of a dust and God is greater than the universe. And we see a, a little light and we know, oh, I know God. We know nothing. This is all we can know. And that's enough to be saved. God is love. Listen carefully now. Why is this important? It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God. Do you want me to repeat this? From the beginning, before creation, from the beginning, Satan went to the angels and said, do you really think that God is what he says? He is love? I doubt that. Why doesn't he let you have power that he has? And started to misrepresent God's character and said, God is not love. That's why he told Eve, do you think that you will die? Now he's afraid that you'll become as him. You will not die. What was he there? Telling lies about who God is. You follow me? You will not die. He is afraid that you become like him. Satan tried to misrepresent God. Because if he can present God different than what God is, we will not trust God. And if we don't trust God, we will lose salvation. He causes people to cherish false conceptions of God. So they regard him with fear and hate rather than love. The cruelty that is Satan's character is attributed to the creator. And then it's embodied in the systems of religion and expressed in the modes of worship. Can it be that our worship is influenced by a wrong conception of God? Our prayers are influenced by a wrong conception of God? That's Satan's desire. Thus the minds are blinded and Satan secures them as his agents. Wow! And talks about religious people. Listen, folks. To know God is vital, so vital, that is, this is the single truth in the universe, in the Bible, in the history that can save us. And nothing else would ever make any difference unless we have this one. With this one, all doctrines make sense and, and are extremely important. Without this one, all the others don't make sense and don't make any difference. I want to give you this that is basically extremely important. Jesus came to save, but he didn't come only to save. He came to show who God is, to show God's character, to make God known. Jesus, the Son of God, came from heaven to manifest the Father. Steps to Christ, page 11. Show us the Father. You have been with me, Philip. And you say you don't know the Father? He who has seen me has seen the Father. What is Jesus saying? That the Father has the same face and height and weight and everything like Jesus had there? Is that what he said to Philip? Or he said, you know my love? You know that the Father loves you. Do you follow me? Jesus didn't come only to save, but to show who God is. Because if we get this one, we are saved. And if the universe gets this one, the universe is safe for the eternity. As soon as we know God, we get eternity. The whole Bible is based on this. In fact, all religions, all ideas, all rules, all teachings, all are good if they prove this one, that God is love. The Ten Commandments, First four, love for God. Next six, love for people. It's all about love. If you keep them and you don't love, you are a Pharisee. I know people of the church that they say they love God and love the neighbor. And as soon as you listen a little, they start criticizing. If you love people, you don't criticize them. You pray for them. If you love people, you don't even judge them in your mind. Because you love as God loves. You pray for them and help them. As soon as you judge somebody, judgment is from Satan. 
Satan is the accuser. Satanos means the accuser of his brethren. It's Satan's character. God's character is to sacrifice yourself and to save people. Mary comes and God says, Jesus says, what are your condemners? And she looks around, they left. And Jesus says, you know, I got to condemn you. You deserve to die. That's what he said. I do not condemn you. I didn't come to lose. I came to save. Because God is love. And people that will be lost, they will not be lost because they sinned. They will be lost because they refused the love of God. Because the love of God can change the greatest sinner without effort. The problem is not sin. The problem is not challenges or giants that we have to overcome. The problem is to understand that God is love. And to make a desire of your life to seek to know the love of God. Because the more you seek to know the love of God, the safer you are. You don't have to understand how he will save you. You cannot. You need to be God to understand how he works. You don't need to deserve. You don't need to understand how he gives you victory over certain sins or habits. You just need to seek to understand that God is love. Let's move to the next slide. The whole Bible is based on this truth. The law is based on this truth. The doctrines tell one story, one theme. And we should continually seek to know this truth, that God is love. And therefore, the Bible says, he who does not love does not know God. Because this is God. God is love. This is eternal life, to know God. To know the love that passes human knowledge. Listen what the book of Acts says. The church is the depository of what? It doesn't say the doctrines. Am I talking against the doctrines? I just want you to get the picture that this is the center that everything else would make sense and be good. But we need to seek to make sure that we get the center. If not, it's going to be the salad on the tooth. We need to make sure that when we have all of the good stuff, we have the center right. The church is the depository of God's love. That's what we need to present to the world. That's what makes evangelism have power to save. That's what makes people come when we reflect the love of God. And we cannot reflect the love of God by learning theoretical knowledge. We reflect the love of God by spending time with God and seeking to know Him. The more we behold Him, the more we are transformed without even knowing that we are transformed. In every true disciple, listen, there are disciples, but not all are true. In every true disciple, this love burns on the altar of the heart. It was on the earth that the love of God was revealed to Christ. It is on the earth that his children are to reflect his love. So when people ask, what do you believe? Should you tell them the 28 doctrines? Or you should say, I believe in a God that is wonderful. That is amazing that when I reflect him, I am speechless. When I look to God, I am just blown away. And I say, man, I cannot understand a thing. But I am just in, I am in shock. I love you too. They say, well, we believe in that too. Really? Tell me about the love of God. And just after you convey that God is love, then you can tell them how God loves. Because the commandments make sense if they express God's love for you. And if you look careful, go and get from the media the Ten Commandments series. And you'll see how each commandment actually makes sure that you are happy and blessed. Because they are not Ten Commandments, but they are Ten Blessings. That would secure your happiness and blessing and safety and salvation. Not by obeying them, but by understanding God's love. Therefore, he says here, Thus, sinners, who? Sinners will be led to the cross to behold what? The Lamb of God. To behold the love of God, we can say. There is no other way to tell God's story. There is no other way to have influence above, upon anyone. No other way to grasp a glimpse of what God is like. To come even closer to God. There is only one way to begin and end. One way to have peace, power, and joy. One way to have abundant life here, eternal life there. There is one way, and that's in one three-word sentence. God is love. 
And to reflect upon that sentence, upon that love, it should be the goal of our life. We should wish to understand, seek to know, desire and thirst for the love of God. To behold it is the single way to be changed and saved. It is the truth that we have about God. God is love. We are done for today. But we started a new series. And this is the first. And we'll go digging into what God means. What love of God means. And we'll go through a few sermons. And the more we go, the deeper we go and take examples from Bible. But until then, this is what we need to get. Two more slides. This is the gospel. If you want to know the gospel, this is the gospel. God is love. It is to know the love of God and to be filled with his presence. The gospel is not about the promises that you made to God or the things that you do for God. It is the promises that God makes to you and the things that he does for you and you reflect upon it, you are amazed and you accept them by faith. That's the gospel. And that would change you. You are not changed to deserve the love. You accept the love and then you are changed. That's the gospel. Unless you seek this truth, your religion is empty and powerless and dead. We must seek to know God and his love if anything lasting is going to happen in our life. Only then God can work in us and through us. Church, Jesus is coming soon. You look around and you see the things that are happening. People are asking more and more about the Adventist church. In fact, I go to get a haircut, and the lady, we talk and talk, and the lady says, what do you work? I'm a pastor. What church? Seventh-day Adventist church in Lexington. Oh, like Ben Carson. I said, no, he doesn't go to our church. Yes, I know, but he's a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes. Well, folks, you know what I did? I said, no. I thought she should tell me that she did something wrong and have me pray for her. Uh -uh. I went on the internet and Googled Seventh-day Adventist because I want to know what I vote for. She's voting for Seventh-day Adventists. And she said, I'm going to vote for you folks. I said, you don't vote for us. You, you, if you vote, you vote for Ben Carson. Oh, no, I need to know what you believe, guys. And I know now. And the Sabbath and this and that, uh, you got it wrong. She says, what do you mean? I Googled it carefully. We believe that God is love. Oh, 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 oh. And she was lost. We believe that too. I said, well, then you should have joy. And she was puzzled. What do you mean? If you understand the love of God, you are already in heaven. She says, nobody told me that. People are searching about us. They need to know what the Bible says. They need to see the love of God. You follow me? That's when they are attracted. The church is called to do that. God is calling this church to grasp this truth. To make it central. To seek his presence, to pray for his presence, to pray to be filled with the love of God, with the presence of God. To pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit and God's love to be poured in us. When we get this, everything else is going to come without effort. And everything else is going to make sense and have power. It is time that we understand and seek it. Let's pray. Father in heaven... We cannot grasp who you are. But we are happy that you gave us enough to be changed and saved. And it is amazing that three words, God is love, can have so much power that can save somebody like us. So, Father, we don't understand how it works. But we pray that you give us the thirst and the desire to seek to know you to search to know you, to seek to be filled with your presence, filled with your love, and to reflect you to the point that others may know you through us. As we explore this subject, Lord, come with your spirit and open our hearts and fill us with your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.